Okay, assalamu alaikum. I'm Dr. Mustafa Hosni from Think Like a Physician Academy. Uh, welcome to all of you uh, in our academy. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate all of you who have uh, bought the PLAB 1 test. And I wish you all the success in the PLAB 2 test, inshallah. Uh, today, we're going to uh, have a kind of introduction about the PLAB 2 test for all the newcomer uh, joiners for the uh, today's session. Uh, we're going to discuss some uh, models uh, based on which the PLAB 2 uh, is made as, as an exam. So we're going to start with the competency-based professional model. Then we're going to discuss the medical care models. Then uh, we will discuss the interpersonal communication model. Uh, after that, we're going to discuss the medical interview with its four parameters, the setting, the communication channel, the communication approaches, then the knowledge basis. And then we are going to discuss the socially distanced PLAP2 test, which is the new format of the PLAP2 test based on uh, these models. And after finishing the introduction, we're going to make a brief uh, explanation and discussion uh, on the neurology chapter for the PLAP2 test. Okay, let's start. So first of all, there is a famous professional model based on the competencies that is uh, applied on many uh, business industries. And the medical profession is one of those industries. So in this model, uh, we have a word called uh, competency. One competency is made of uh, three sub sets of knowledge skills and attitudes, or we can call this attitude behavior. So for each profession to be able to perform your duties within this profession, you have to have these competencies. And each competency is made up uh, of something that you should know and something you should be able to do and a specific set of attitudes or behaviors that you should uh, like that should, should, should show during performing your duties. For the medical professional competencies, we can apply this model by saying that to be a medical professional, you have to have some knowledge. This knowledge can be technical or we can call it medical knowledge and some other general non-medical knowledge. This includes some administrative and legal rules knowledge. For the skills category, you can say that you have to have and acquire some medical skills and you have to acquire some non-medical skills. For all the attitude, there are some attitudes and behavior that are specific for the medical profession and some other general or non-medical attitudes. These are like kind of uh, generally accepted behaviors and attitude that should be uh, in any profession. So based on this model, uh, medical curricula are made to give you some knowledge and teach you some skills and help you attain or acquire some attitudes and behaviors. And based on the same model, the exams are made to test your knowledge like, like it's done in PLAP 1 and to test your skills and attitudes like what is done in PLAP 2. And the same will apply when you are going to apply for jobs. They will ask you to provide an evidence on your knowledge and to provide an evidence that you have certain kinds and certain sets of skills and to show that you have certain professional attitudes and behaviors. And this should match your job and your job level. Okay, so it's, it's a kind of continuum that you study and you get tested and you work based on the same model. So we can subclassify the medical categories for both skills and knowledge to be core or common and specialized knowledge and skills. For the junior level, you're always asked to show that you have the core knowledge and the core skills based on some guidelines that is that are uh, distributed by the GMC, made and distributed by the GMC. So for the PLAP2 exam, you are tested as a junior doctor. So you are uh, required to show that you have the core knowledge and the core skills and the attitudes. And 
at any point, you should avoid showing that you have any specialized knowledge, uh, even if you have it, because for the purpose of the exam, you're a junior doctor, and if you show it that you can uh, use this specialized knowledge, you are going beyond your level of authority, which is considered wrong for the exam and for the job. Okay, so let's apply it in the medical uh, domain. So we can say that a core, a core medical knowledge can be knowing the normal blood pressure values. So um, everyone should know the blood pressure values. However, only a specialist neurologist can be able to identify the normal value for EEG. On the other hand, the, uh, we can say that non-medical knowledge can be some kind of administrative knowledge. That, that's when you, uh, you should know when to refer and to whom you should refer and wh what administrative process should you go through to make a referral. This kind of knowledge is not medical. However, it's important for the medical professional to know. And sometimes they play with it in the blab to exam. Another non-medical knowledge example is legal regulations, like the Mental Health Act, the power of attorney. These kind of knowledge uh, are not considered medical. However, they are important for the medical professionals. So they can be considered uh, a medical, a part of the medical professional competencies. Under which category? The non-medical knowledge. Okay, the skills, core skills can be like history taking as a skill. So this is very important and everyone should be able, every medical professional should be able to take history. That's why the blab to test will test your ability to take history. Another skill can be venipuncture, when you insert a cannula or uh, give an injectable uh, drug. So this form of a skill is kind of basic skill. And there is uh, a file from the DMC explaining the basic practical procedures and skills that, that are expected from the junior doctors. So that's why in PLAT2, you will find something like venipuncture station, testing your skill on doing the venipuncture. So this is a form of core medical skill. On the other hand, you can find specialist medical skill like doing coronary catheterization, which is a specialist skill for the cardiologists. So you will never, uh, you'll never be tested or uh, something like this on the blab to test, the blab to test. On the other category of non-medical skills, you can find a, a very broad category called soft skills. This include listening, skill, listening skills, negotiation skills, and many more. These non-medical skills are very important for the medical professionals. And unfortunately, in many countries, those skills are not taught as part of the medical curriculum. For the UK, they teach it. They teach these skills, they teach them. So they test you on them. So you are expected to have many non-medical skills and you're, you should be able to show them in the exam. You should be able to show that you, you can listen carefully to the person who's talking to you. You can get into a professional negotiation and be professional and logic while you talk and so on. Last category, attitudes and behaviors. They are very, very important. One of the most famous attitudes nowadays in medical uh, practice is to be to, is to show a patient focused attitude. And we're going to discuss it later. However, I would like to say that this is, uh, uh, this is a part of a worldwide trend in many business industries to be customer focused. So for any business industry, uh, the new trend is to be focusing on your customer, not the employee or not the resources. For, for the medical profession, the customer is the patient. So you have to be patient focused to give your uh, uh, focus to the patient and be focused on the patient to uh, make the patient your most important person uh, during your work. Another attitude is, which is important in the medical profession is to be empathic, to be sensitive, because in the medical profession, you deal with patients, uh, patients in pain, persons in pain or family members uh, who are sad because they have lost someone or some uh, beloved ones are, are in severe pain and so on. You shouldn't never be robotic 
while giving the, the medical services, even if you are giving them the right services, you should always show that you are empathic, you are uh, feeling or at least respecting what they feel. Non-medical attitude can be mutual respect. In any industry, in any kind of business, you will always be required to show that you respect others and expect others to respect you. So these are uh, one, two, three, four, five, six categories. You have to fill them all. Okay, starting from the knowledge, you have to get some knowledge, medical knowledge, non-medical knowledge. Then you develop your skill and get some practice to develop them more and more and learn and develop your behavior, behaviors and attitudes to show them in the exam and your job afterwards. Okay, am I clear so far? Okay. So how can we develop these uh, competencies? We, as I told you, we start from the core. So we start from the core knowledge, core skills and core behavior attitudes. And for the UK, we they call it uh, graduate competencies or foundation year one and two competencies. Okay, those are the competencies expected in the medical graduates. And those represent the undergraduate medical curriculum. Okay, so for any medical graduate, he is expected uh, to show that he has certain level of knowledge, some kinds of skills to show certain behaviors and attitude. After some time, uh, the medical professional will develop more knowledge, more skills, more professional behaviors to build up another layer. For the UK, we can call it core trainee or uh, specialist trainee, year one, year two, year three, and so on. After many layers, you can, up, you can add, uh, add as many as you can. And by applying these layers in real life environments, you're building your experience. And now we can say that you are an expert, okay? So now for the exam, we are at this level, the core level. Yeah, we need to know the core knowledge, practice on the core skills and attitude and behaviors. Okay. Okay. So the next point in today's session will be the medical care models. So there are two medical care models, disease focused model and patient focused model. For the disease focused model, the medical professional is focused on managing the disease. For the patient focus model, the medical professional should be focusing on managing both the disease and any other problems of the patient having the disease. Okay? When you do that, you can say that I have a patient focused attitude and I'm following the patient focused medical care model. And that is what we need in the exam. In many stations in the exam, uh, the patient will giving you uh, a medical problem plus personal problem or social problem. He can he has he's having problem at work. He is having some troubles at at home. He has some financial troubles, and so on. So in your management, you should be addressing the disease and managing the disease and any other problems of the patient having the disease, okay? That is what we mean by patient-focused approach or patient-focused care model or patient-focused attitude. Okay, the interpersonal communication, the third point in today's session. So there is a famous uh, model of what we call linear communication, the simple communication, the simplest model, which is called SMCR. What is SMCR communication model? In this model, to have a communication between two persons, you need to have sender and message and channel and receiver. So the sender is sending a message to the receiver through a channel. Okay, SMCR. That is why we call it the SMCR. It's an acronym. Okay, how it works, how this, how does uh, this model work? So, here the sender sending a message to a receiver who is receiving the message. 
through a communication channel. We will talk about the possible or the, the different communication channels in a while. So then the sender wants to send a message to this receiver with a core idea. This core idea is within the sender's mind and he wants to develop it, to deliver it to the receiver's mind. To make that, he uh, or she uh, should know what to say to deliver this core idea. That is what we call the verbal layer of the message. And it's not just about words, it's how to say what you want to say. And that is what we call the non-verbal layer. So the complete, the complete message will have a core idea and a verbal representation of this core idea and a non-verbal representation of this core idea. So the verbal representation will be through saying words and making sentences that deliver this idea. The non-verbal layer of the message can be made up of many techniques that we're going to discuss in a while. So that is your core idea. That is what you should say to deliver this core idea. And that is how to say what you want to say to deliver this core idea. Okay. So as you see that this core idea is uh, hidden deep inside under or underneath the verbal and nonverbal layers of the message. We call this encoding. So the sender is encoding the idea by adding verbal and nonverbal layers. On the other hand, the receiver will be, uh, will be doing decoding of this message by understanding the nonverbal layer, then understanding the verbal layer to reach the core idea that the sender wants to deliver it to them. Okay. So the sender is making encoding by adding verbal and nonverbal layers. The receiver is, ma is making decoding by understanding the nonverbal layers and verbal layers to reach the core idea. Okay, so that is decoding. That is encoding, that is decoding. Okay, clear? Okay. So we have many nonverbal communication techniques of which I'm going to uh, mention uh, the following. We can use our facial expressions. We can use the eye gaze. We can use hand gestures. We can use our body posture and body movement. We can use or change our voice characters. We call it paralinguistics. This includes the tone of voice, the pitch of voice, the loudness of voice, the inflection of voice. Another nonverbal communication technique can be in our appearance or the distance or space we leave uh, with the receiver. We call it proxemics or by touching the receiver that is haptics. So proxemics and haptics are not applied in the plapto test. We can use the others. So for the facial expressions, we can smile in the beginning of the station. When we deliver good news, we can be smiling too. We, when we deliver bad news, we can be showing some empathic face. For eye gazing, it's important to maintain an eye contact with your patient, okay? Mm -hmm. A fluctuating eye gaze that is looking upward and downward, right and left, means you are not confident or you are hesitant. You are vague, you are covering something in your idea or core content of your message. This applies to you as a sender or a doctor in this station, or this applies also to the patient. If the patient is telling you that uh, I have this burn in my tummy because I was like making some tea and it fell to me. But the patient is not giving you an eye contact. He seems to be lying. Then you understand that the core content that the patient is lying and this is not what happened. In that way, you should ask the patient, please 
to me more in in small details about what happens i'm here to like help you you are driving him another message that you are here to help him and your voice should tell that too the hand gestures using your hands to express your ideas body posture the way you sit in the chair in the cubicle the way you move in stations in the stations uh, that needs you to move okay this can tell if you are confident or hesitant paralinguistics the voice characters using the right tone well uh, the right tone to the context this can help you deliver your message in the right way and if you can understand the tone of voice of your uh, uh, other person you can understand the right message he can he, he wants to to deliver okay also the pitch and the loudness of the voice the inflection it is a fluctuation of the voice i can raise my voice or talk slow uh, like uh, make my voice very low in each situation i should match my uh, voice to the context to deliver a complete and a coherent message my appearance in the exam should be always professional okay and the gmc confirms on that 